Dr. Joseph White, I am here because of you. When I got the call that Long Beach, Cal State Long Beach was celebrated and would acknowledge the incredible contribution that my friend and classmate from what was then San Francisco State College would be acknowledged and honored. I said, no matter what I'm doing, I'm dropping what I'm doing. I'm coming. And then to drop my Friday morning radio show, my Friday morning two tapings for Sunday television, that's a hell of a revenue drop. <laughs> so now you know I appreciate Joe White a lot. A lot. However, you should know that on the 50th anniversary of EOP programs in the state of California, we clearly should all pause. And when the list was read of the number of people of substance and stature who are here, is, I'm just delighted. President of this institution, the local elected officials from the city of Long Beach, those who have been responsible on the committee side for putting this event together, and someone said, it's been two years in the planet. Let me share with you how incredible important EOP is, has been, and will be. I graduated from high school, as did Dr. White, long before Brown versus the Board of Education. Brown versus Board of Education had nothing to do with my family. We may have been owned at one time, the Browns, by the same people, but Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, came three or more years after I graduated from high school. I graduated from a, an alleged separate but equal high school in a little place called Mineola, Texas. That high school, I went to a black college called Prairie View a and on a scholarship in Hempstead, Texas. You get a scholarship, and it's not like the scholarship you're familiar with. It's a scholarship that means three days after you graduate from high school, you're off to college because you got to help do the crops that feeds the students. That's what your scholarship says. One of your obligations happens to be. Well, of course, I had a different interpretation of scholarship, so I got kicked out of Prayer View. Within three weeks of my arrival at Prayer View, I was sent back home. My mother wouldn't have me come back home. It was an embarrassment to the family that the kid that allegedly went off to school, went off to college, was suddenly thrown out of school. I was thrown out because I tried to organize a different arrangement with reference to the food program. And a different arrangement with reference to walking on the sidewalks where there were girls after dark. All of those things were not acceptable. And believe me, there was no such thing as a place you can go appeal your interests. No place you could go to have student advocacy, none of that. The president of those schools simply got rid of it <coughs> if you were not suited in their view as a student. And I was not suited. My mother couldn't have me come home. That would be a terrible embarrassment. So she did what she had not ever wanted to do. She sent me to San Francisco to live with an uncle that had never gone to anybody's church, had never had a job. She knew that he operated on the 
south side of life. And, and she didn't want me to be influenced that way. She wanted me to be somebody. But the embarrassment of being kicked out of college was too much. She got a commitment from, from my uncle that as soon as I arrived, he'd make me join church, and he would see that I immediately went to Stanford. And my mother was overjoyed that I was going to Stanford. So I arrived in, in, in San Francisco, and my uncle says he didn't know anything about Stanford. He didn't know anybody connected with Stanford. But he knew where it was, and that I should go on down there if I'm smart. I should go on down there and get myself in that school. This was August 4th, 1951. I went down to Stanford, and I had, I finished second in my class on graduation. You know, don't get upset. <laughs> don't be impressed. There were only 13 people in that class. <laughs> so I clearly, you know, finished. And when I got down to Stanford, I said, I really appreciate your candid review of this issue. Because at that moment, I was also looking at the price. <laughs> Rejection was necessary. And no way I was able to get in there under those circumstances. But he was a very nice man. His name was Duncan Gillies. He said, you know, I work here as an admission person, but I teach at a college in the Haight in San Francisco called San Francisco State College. And they are desperate for students. And I think I can get you in there without you taking any examination, without anything, but you've got to perform well enough to stay in there on your own by the end of the first semester. So I got admitted. I am literally the first EOP admittee. <laughs> Well, I got to San Francisco State, and I met people like Joe White. There was a, only a few African Americans in attendance there, and I think only Joe White and one or two others of us were not military veterans. Most of the people on the color side were veterans. They were there getting GI benefits, which satisfied us tremendously because they had money, and we did and it was a good working relationship. Well, Brown versus the Board of Education comes along. Needless to say, it was okay. I managed to somehow navigate. I got cinch notices the first six or eight weeks, but after that, I was okay because they grew, they grade at that time on that bell curve. And all you had to do was get on the other side of that curve. And I have always been able to get on the other side of every curve. So I got on the other side of it, the curve, and I became a real student at San Francisco State College. 1954, the NAACP and the various civil rights organizations had engaged in activities that had led ultimately to the decision made by the Supreme Court. There had been a whole series of other places where lawsuits had been filed, including in Texas, Sweat versus Painter, whole series, McLaren, whole series of cases where people had been trying to get some opportunity for equal education. Earl Warren, former governor of the state of California, chief justice of the Supreme Court, orchestrated that decision. And we all rejoiced. But our rejoice was short because there is clearly no path in this country to get that particular decision implemented. On top of that decision, the civil rights movement really commenced. Rosa Parks refused to get up, a whole bunch of other people. Martin came along and was given the responsibility to put together the program that would get Rosa Parks a ride along with all the rest of us. A whole series of organizations arose from the time of that decision. All focused on the idea that somehow we can ultimately implement Brown versus the Board of Education. At each stage of the implementation, it was clear there had been too many implementations of the old separate process. There had been too many implementations of all of the racism that exists in this country, all of the post 
slavery that introduces itself in this country on every basis. There have been just too much. The business of thinking you could open the door and certainly we would all run in was crazy. There had to be some steps taken. And a part of that process over the next 12 or 14 years, post Brown versus the Board of Education, was getting us to the point of programs like EOP. I got elected to the legislature in 1964. By 1966, all of the things that we had experienced over the years of trying to bridge the gap, all of the demonstrations that had taken place in this nation on behalf of equal opportunity in every category had been to, in one manner or another, synthesize itself. And in the world of education, nothing was more impressive than what educators had begun to do and say about the students and the gap existing between traditional students and non-traditional students. Suddenly, legislative bodies all over the country begin to think, how can we help? How can we provide the tools for implementation? And believe me, it took some real doing. But the legislative bodies in this nation, and in particular, the legislative bodies in California, adopted steps that could be taken in the grammar schools, in the high schools, all across the educational spectrum, but in particular at the college level. And as they did that, and as all of the activities that had occurred in the civil rights movement and all the demonstrations that had taken place, the concept of EOP became a reality for the state of California. That was part of what the legislature was able to do. But the process of implementing it remained as it does even today in the hands and the souls of the people who are right on the scene where the students are, who are in fact doing the programs, who are conducting the classes, who are doing all the things that need to be done to ensure that all of the rules and the visions and the regulations ultimately will, will allow for people to step up and actually gain the opportunity for an education, even though at some point they may have been denied all of the prep that would lead to it. EOP, under the influence of people like Dr. Joseph White, and in particular Joe White, this nation owes Joe White and his counterparts in other states and in other universities a profound thank you because they were the ones who said to their professorial colleagues, this is a program and a set of rules and regulations that will benefit this nation like no other because it will afford the opportunity for a huge treasure of brains and talent to be ultimately unleashed. It will provide the opportunity for that talent to be given access to all of the systems that will ultimately lead to their being able to contribute to society in a very handsome way that will participate in relieving us of all the misery. And I must say that the nature of what has occurred as a result of EOP can be measured all across this nation, in almost every institution in this nation. There is some remnant of it. And it not only at the outset was directed primarily at people of color, it has managed somehow to bridge the gap for everybody who are in the category of non-traditional types in the educational delivery system. I will close by telling you that when I got on the airplane to come down here, and I came down by Jet Blue, <laughs> some white guy recognized me. He said, where are you going? And I told him where I was going. What are you doing at Long Beach State? I told him, he said, well, you know, this Trump thing is an issue, isn't it? I said, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> he said, well, I got one for you. He said, can you imagine how this nation could possibly wake up if the billionaire, white billionaire, Donald Trump, ends up winning the presidency? Just think 
he is going to have to move into public housing previously <laughs> vacated by a black family. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Suddenly I realized my reservations about that white man <laughs> went right out the window because he gave me my closing. Congratulations, Dr. Joseph White. <laughs>